<clears throat> it's Comics Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. It is lovely today, actually, on this lovely, lovely, lovely May afternoon. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, what goes into uh, developing characters, ideas, stories, mm -hmm. uh, developing your art style, even comics lifestyle. Wh wh how do cartoonists live uh, and how do we advocate for comics? All the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Joe's cart cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today in studio. Hey, Jersey. Is, yes, Dave Carter. Hey, glad to be back. Thanks for having me. Dave reads comics on the Twitters. On the Twitters and, and Dave buys comics for the U of M library and Dave reads yeah, comics, comics, comics. Yeah. <laughs> and Dave collects <laughs> video games for the UM yeah. video game library. Yeah. And you also run a blog at yet another comics blog blogspot. Which occasionally has something posted to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to make time for this stuff, man. You got too many video games to collect and add to the collection. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the virtual boy in All right, a little All right. bit later in the show. Uh, so then also on the Skypes, we have a uh, first time on the show. Super excited to talk to him, uh, Chris Jerusso. Uh, Hi, how you doing? ChrisGComics.com. Author of the amazing, amazing G-Man comic series. Uh, book three just came out. And as a matter of fact, as we stream live today, May 15th, uh, this is the last day to win some stuff by, by purchasing G-Man, right? Uh, yes, I think that's correct. Uh, Greg Shegel's running a little campaign over at StuffSaid.com. Or st uh, stuff where he's just show. giving away a bunch of his own stuff. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> stuff said show, uh, dot com. He's giving away like what, like SpongeBob artwork and uh, oh, a whole bunch of amazing things that he's giving away there. Uh, but today's the last day. You have to go out and get the book, prove that you got the book, and then you let Greg know, and you can get some stuff. So. Uh, we will link to it in the show notes, but by the time this episode airs on the website or rather in the podcast feed, it will be too late. But that doesn't... So that, yet another reason to tune in live. Tune in live. That's, that's right. right. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm exempt from entering anyway, so... <laughs> so it doesn't matter to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but people should get this book anyway because I just finished book three last night and oh my gosh, it just knocked me on my butt, Chris. Uh, I, I said on Twitter, I think this might be the perfect superhero comic. Well, th thank you very much. It's very flattering. It's the highest praise I could ever hope for, and I appreciate it. But uh, we should we should tell people about what G-Man is about for those who haven't, for those you know few people watching the show who haven't heard of this thing. Um, and the, the crazy thing, I mean, this is what I love about superheroes, and this is what you've done so well, is like on paper, the premise sounds crazy. Okay, it's a boy with a magic cape. His brother got a magic belt that was taken from material from the magic cape. There's a wizard who makes some pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he gets sent out on missions to solve problems. He's got a bunch of other superhero friends. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's, like, the, the thing that I want to talk about later, you know, in, in my notes here is, like, there's threats. There's real threats of danger and physical violence, but never so far that it feels like, oh, this is too much for kids. Uh, as I was reading it, it really felt like played straight uh, Silver Age comics without the absurd aspects. Like, the absurd aspects feel natural in the world of it, right? Like, if a giant purple gorilla shows up, you don't go, oh, he's being campy. It feels right in this world, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, my take is that pretty much anything can happen in this world. Like, I, I think G-Man lives in a world that's populated. Like, his city has... Captain Thunderman and the Thunder Friends, but I think that the world is just so overpopulated with superheroes, much like the industry itself, that it's it's kind of you don't really flinch when something crazy happens anymore. Everyone just kind of accepts what what happens. But but by the way, Captain Thunderman and the Thunder Friends is the best superhero team name I've ever heard. <laughs> it was Thank one of those you. things. It's one of those things where when I read it, I was like, oh god, that's good. I wish I would have thought of that. <laughs> But uh, maybe we should just jump there because, like, one of the things that is so appealing about this book is, and, and I want to talk about this in a general roundtable discussion about, you know, like writing stories that are appealing to kids, uh, is kid logic. 
And you talk about like building a world where anything can happen. And I'm reminded of something Ron Friedman once said. Uh, Ron Friedman was a comic book writer, but he also wrote like many of the uh, quintessential G.I. Joe Real American Hero episodes. And he said the trick was is to write to create a world where you can have anything happen and the audience doesn't stop and question it, right? Like you never want your audience to say, why did that guy go by on that weird sailplane thing? You want the audience to say, oh, cool, cool, that's neat. I wonder what else they got in this world. And that's, having made some comics myself, that's easier said than done. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I wonder if you could speak to that, Chris, like building a world where anything can happen. Uh, I mean, there's still got to be some kind of internal kid logic to it of some sort. Do you think about yeah. that when you're writing? Um. I don't know. I just, I just think that like the, the supernatural and the super powerful, all that kind of stuff, you know, that, that does kind of need to follow its own internal logic, but you know, you can make up any rules you want. These are what the powers are. These are what they do. Here's what their weaknesses are, if any. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what's more important is like the choices that the characters make given the, those circumstances. So but like you said, it's easier said than done, you know. So I, I just kind of like I'll, I'll I'll write a story, and a lot of times I might think like it would be cool to do a certain thing, but then I think, well, no, this would make no logical sense for the character to do this, even though it would be a cool thing. So I got to figure out some other way out of a situation. So there's a character logic that works in tandem with the world logic. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's kind of like, um. You know, everybody that sets out to make comics in some form or another, they're they're set, they're setting out, or at least superhero comics. They're like, well, this is how it would be if superheroes were real. So, which kind of <laughs> sounds uh, strange coming from me, but to me, like the most realistic aspect is that if I had superpowers and if I was super strong and I could fly, my brother would not be impressed in the least. <laughs> <laughs> And he would just be hypercritical. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the relationship between G-Man and Great Man, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't take away any of the sibling rivalry that we all go through. Which is more universal, right? Um, yeah, I mean, not everyone has superpowers, but lots and lots and lots of kids have younger or older siblings. Right. And so, so you throw that sort of rivalry in, and they're like, oh, yeah, I can relate to that. I, I can't relate to flying. I want to fly. But I can't relate to flying, but I can relate to my older brother being kind of a jerk to me all the time. Right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so, so when they see something familiar to them, then, you know, you can accept the fantastic much more, much more easily, I think. Yeah, and the fantastic in the book is played out, like, very matter-of-factly, where it's like, oh, how do you get your powers? Well, it's a cape. What's the cape do? Oh, it gives me super strength and uh, flying and invulnerability. And in book two, Cape Crisis, there's like this wonderful sequence where the kids are all like doing what kids do, where they're like, well, uh, so you're invulnerable. Or no, he says, I'm, I'm near, nearly invulnerable or almost invulnerable. Sort of, it's almost or sort of or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I'm sort of invulnerable. Like, you can't be sort of invulnerable. You're either invulnerable <laughs> or you're not invulnerable. It's like, right, well, right. well, I can get hurt, but it takes a lot to hurt me. So it's sort of, you know, it's, it, you, you took some time with that scene, which was really great. But, but yeah, but you know, it's like when people say kid logic. Uh, a lot of times I th see it get filtered down into, um, Oh, you know, it's like uh, a dolphin making out with a dinosaur on the back of a skeleton unicorn with laser rainbow eyes. That's right? too much. Right? Like, well, it's kid logic. It's just, you know, throwing a whole bunch of cool things together, right? And, like, an explosion behind it. And, you know, it's like, like I think of, like, some of the jokes on the oatmeal. Great comic. Love the oatmeal. But, like, that is from the mindset of an adult making absurdity, right? right Whereas right. kids, when they tell stories, they're not pushing for absurdity right to them the absurdity is a real logical thing does that make sense am i talking nonsense no i i, I, I think you're right and, and also kids i think tend to be a little more stream of consciousness when they're making up their own stories <laughs> it's like this happens and then this happens and you know they're not they don't have the end game necessarily plotted out in their heads it's just you know event to event to event to event mm -hmm. and i think the trick when you know someone like chris is is creating a comic trying to incorporate kid logic but also have be plotting and everything like that. I, I'm assuming you're plotting this thing. <laughs> if, if you're not, you're doing a really good job. Uh, if, sometimes, if, this, if, he, if he's not plotting, this last he's one is more plotted than uh, than Cape Crisis was. But yeah, so so um, yeah, getting that balance of when you're doing comics for kids of, of getting like you say Jersey the kid logic, but also having you know 
mature storytelling techniques thrown mm -hmm. in there as well. I think that's that can sometimes be why writing for kids, I think, can be more challenging than, than just writing for adults. I would agree with that. So, like, what, I mean, asking you, like, a technical question, Chris, uh, this may be something that you just intuit, right? But if, if this is something that actually comes up in discussions between you and other creators, I'm curious to know what these discussions are. Like, how do you walk the line between writing absurdity and writing something that feels honest to a kid's view, uh, worldview? Um, well, I, I don't know that I've ever really thought that hard about it because <laughs> this has always been the way that I've written. I haven't really, I, I don't come from a place where, oh, well, I used to write this way and then somebody asked me to do something for kids. I've always written from, from a, a, a vantage point of like, oh, like when I started, I wanted to be a newspaper syndicated comic strip artist guy. So those are kind of inherently family friendly to begin with and that focuses on the humor. But my love of superheroes eventually worked its way into that, and you know, three panels wasn't enough for me, so I really embraced doing the longer stories. But you know, I don't think I've ever actually had a conversation where this, we discussed this concept of kid logic before. Mm. So I, like, I, I tend to think, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe I was a really smart kid or I'm a really dumb adult, <laughs> but I don't think I think much differently than I did when I was 10. So basically, Jersey and I are overanalyzing this We're, we're thing. overthinking <laughs> it. We're, no, we, we totally are, right? I mean, and like th that's what you do when, I mean, I'm, I'm coming at this from an educator standpoint. I teach comics classes, and part of my job is i got to think about what's going through my head when I'm doing this stuff so I can, you know, create exercises that get kids to think in those directions. But I'm reminded, let's talk about Greg she uh, Shegel, who is in studio with you, although he's not on camera, um, of the Stuff Said Show. When I was on his show a while back, um, he said something to the effect of, oh, if I remember right, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but he, he accused me of being mature for wanting to do kids' stories uh, when I was a young man. Like when I was in my early 20s, I decided I want to do comics for kids. And he said, that's a very mature attitude. And my, my reaction was very similar to yours, Chris, where I was like, no, I think it's an immature thing because I just like love He-Man the same way I did when I was eight, you know, and I want to do stories like that. Uh, but, no, but I see what he's saying, though. I think he, the idea being like you, you're a little bit more big picture about about the whole thing, and you're more concerned about, well, at least, you know, maybe I'm projecting, but like <laughs> I, I I like to I like my comics to be fun, and I like to I like to make comics that made me feel the way I did when I was a kid, which had a lot more fun in them and a lot less discussing, you know, who's who's what superheroes dating who. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but also, you know, it's like when, when people talk about making stories for young people, they also think that they have to strip out, um, you know, any real talk of dangerous situations, right? Let's, like, like when you talk about broadcast standards and practices, has anybody ever seen that image that Bruce Timm did of uh, the, the Batman animated series image that captures everything you can't do in a <laughs> yeah, kid's cartoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's jumping through a window and Catwoman looks sexy and I think there's like a cigarette. and <laughs> It's like all the things you can't show in a kid's cartoon is like in this one image. And yet, there are several moments in this book where death is dealt with in a real, real way. And we see great man laying on the ground and for all intents and purposes we the reader go he's dead you know and i look at that and i go like oh man when i think about you know kids books published in the traditional like trade publishing world like you can't do that not not, not as as he, but then i think about like the comics of that i grew up on like the silver age books that kind of danger was there all the time right even in like silly books like superman's pal jimmy olsen you had like real threat of violence and danger in the story dave you want to comment oh, on oh that? yeah and 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 you can't strip that out because and i'm going to overanalyze this here again because <laughs> <laughs> i hang out with academics all the time talking comic books and this sort of creeps in yeah. um but you know ki that's how kids first encounter death and danger and peril is through stories and so that's how and they start to uh, experience it, and they can experience it at a distance. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when they're actually faced with, and some kids are faced with, you know, things soon, sooner than other kids are, unfortunately. But eventually we all have to face death. Mm -hmm. And we don't, in the first time you're facing that, you don't have experience to fall back on, but you have stories that you've, that you've encountered to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And so I think trying to sanitize children's entertainment is, like, the worst way that you can go. 
I mean, you don't want to throw in a bunch of, you know, gratuitous sex and, vi- and over-the-top violence and anything like that, but you can have peril and you can have danger. Yeah. And, you know, there's a reason why Bone is, like, this most beloved comic by, by kids, and it's, and it's not because it plays it safe. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, it's a, you know, it's a, like you said, story fraught with peril and, and, co- and there's complexity and, and everything in there. Mm-hmm. And, and I think kids also like it when, uh, you know, because kids know that, the world is dangerous, and I don't think I think they might react. I think they don't like it when people are being dishonest about, right, right. How, oh, everything is fun and safe. I think they they like the acknowledgement that yes, you're in danger, but you know if you're smart and you have your wits about you, you, you know you can escape it or you can avoid it or you can do things to you know keep yourself safe. Yeah, and and you can make choices that will improve your odds of getting by in this world, right? And that's what a lot of the stories in G-Men are about, are about characters making good choices and bad choices. I mean, book two, Cape Crisis, I don't want to spoil too much in book three, because people should go out and read it. And, uh, <laughs> but book two, it starts out with uh, uh, everybody talking about G-Man's powers, and they're like, hey, uh, since, it's, since the power's in your cape, you should share you know, friends share, and, it, <laughs> and, and they make him feel bad. And he's like, oh, okay, so here, everybody, have a little piece of the material for my cape. And all these kids get superpowers. Great man yells at him. He's like, you idiot, you know, like, you're going to create a whole army of supervillains, which he sort of does by accident. And then, like, as soon as they get all the, the pieces of material back and everything's set right, we find out great man is selling them. He's like, you're, an, he did, you're not an idiot for, for, for sharing. You're an idiot for giving away something that you could be making like a boatload of money on. And then there's, there's consequences to his actions as well. So you've got like a, I mean, is that, is that something that you're using as like a yardstick to, to measure this thing? Is like, like, let's make this about, let's make the peril uh, a consequence of choices? Um, kind, yeah, kind, yeah, basically. Like they, I needed some like. <laughs> I don't really know because I, I mostly all that stemmed from like how would my brother have behaved in these situations, <laughs> and that's what he would have done. And and it, and it wasn't necessarily that like instead of giving them away, we should steal. Like he he does at first think like no, we can't spread this out. It's a bad thing. He's and he, and he's completely right minded in, in behaving that way. He doesn't decide to sell them until like later on when you know, something happens and makes him realize he has no money. And then he, and then he, you know, he gets a little bit greedy about it. But yeah, it, I think every time in life that something goes great, like something else bad happens in the very first G man in the origin story, like the greatest thing in the world happens to him. He can finally fly and he's in the sky for about, you know, five minutes before he gets blasted (laughs) out of it. (laughs) So there's always some kind of countermeasure to anything good that happens. I mean, that's another thing that I noticed in the books that's so good is, yeah, you, you counterbalance all of the heavy stuff with light stuff and the light stuff with heavy stuff. So, like, in book three, you know, there's this scene where somebody's having a baby, and it's a scary, intense moment as having babies are. And the dad is... You know, he's coming in, he's being the good husband, and he's like, okay, you got to breathe, honey. And then he's, be- he's distracting himself by telling stories about how his car collapsed like an accordion over and over. He won't let it go. And, like, and then even when she's screaming at him, you know, you know you're here to help me, and, and interrupts him mid-sentence, and she's breathing, and we cut back to him, he's like, like an accordion. <laughs> he's, still, he's still on that point. And yeah. so like, even though, like, it, and what happens during the delivery scene is actually kind of frightening. I'm like, I'm like, whoa, you know, th- did that just really happen? But it's still funny because it's like you, you, it's always leavened with a little bit of light humor. Um, so I'm guessing that, the, you know, like that's you, you're talking about you, this. This is something that just comes naturally in your voice as an author. But I bet this is something that you respond to. And let's let's, you know, drive a little bit off course here and talk about superheroes. Why do we love superheroes so much? And when we look at the old superheroes, they did that, didn't they? Like the old superhero comics, not today, but like, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you just, when you said we're going to talk about superhero comics for kids, I'm like, well, when I was that age, there were no superhero comics for kids. There were superhero comics. Right. <laughs> right. And you didn't have to do this differentiation between one or the other. Right. Um, and then, you know, well, we could dwell on that for a while. That, that's a whole other discussion, but, <laughs> but we'll just use the ones of our youth as an example of the days when it was for everyone. Right. I mean, you know, when I, when I started watching Super Friends on, on TV when I was, I was, must have been four years old or so, something like that, and, you know, it's, A, it's, it's bright colors and animated and all that kind of stuff, and you got Superman and Batman and, and all these people with bright capes, and they got powers, and they help people. 
mm-hmm. um, and you're and you're thinking, I like to help people. I wish I had powers so that I could help people. But even if I didn't, I could be Batman and have a utility belt and use right. my utility belt to help people. Um, but man, a, you know, a flying invisible jet would be cool. And and <laughs> um, I wish I could swim real fast. And and I had a magic ring and all that ki- all that kind of stuff. So in other words, you wanted the power fantasy. Is that what it is? I, I think that's part of the attraction. Yeah. Um, is is because um, when you're a kid, you're you. Oftentimes, feel powerless to affect the world around you. Yeah, uh, you know, because because your life is sort of prescribed by your parents and, and and that and your situation, and you can't. I mean, you can't when you're three or four years old. You can't even go across the street on your own, let alone fly. True. Um. So you're thinking, man, if only I had po- if I had powers, if I could fly, nobody could stop me from going across the street. <laughs> <laughs> um. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that attraction, and I think that's why kids. I mean, kids love superheroes. Yeah. Right. Uh, Super Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all sort of in Spider Man. There's, there's an 11 year old girl in my comics class right now who is nuts about Thor. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah and I was like, really? Wow. That's like that <laughs> Adventures of Babysitting character. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And you, so it's not that far off. Right. That yeah. That sort of thing. Um, and some of us never outgrow it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so is, I, I don't know. Maybe Chris wants to say. Yeah, what, what yeah. I want to. I want to hear from Chris on this topic. Like, what? What's? Is is it that way for you? Is it just like a never growing up, and you loved him that way now, then, and you love him that way now? Um. Yeah, I think so. Um. You know, it's. I think a lot of people bring up you know power fantasy as if it's something you're supposed to be ashamed of, but uh, I, I don't see why. It's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a real it's. You can't get much simpler than that. Like, oh, why do you think kids would like to be super strong and fly? I don't know. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty complicated. Right? <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm putting that on a T-shirt. It's like, it's just a power fantasy. Yeah, and? <laughs> <laughs> but then also, like, it, you know, as a kid, too, I also was compelled to, like, I wanted to draw all that stuff, which is another thing that's related to my older brother. He, he was an artist, and so I would just draw everything he was drawing. And, it, you know, it, it, after a while, it just becomes a compulsion. Like, I need to figure out how do they make these lines come together this way to make something look cool. Um, so, whereas if I, if, I, if I didn't have that compulsion, I don't know if I'd still be caring about comics so much these days. I'd probably be like, oh, I remember these and go to the movies yeah. and then buy a comic and find out, like, yeah, this isn't really what it was like when I was a kid. So, I want to make, you know, comics like they're old school. Yeah, uh, Dan Mishkin once described uh, a life of, of making comics as a sickness. He's like, it's a sickness. You can't help yeah. doing it, <laughs> right? Uh, and, yeah, I, a lot of cartoonists have agreed with that sentiment, my, myself included. Um, it's not the money. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we use that as a segue into a, a short break on the video that you posted uh, on YouTube? You did a commercial, which... Man, I'm not sure anybody under 20 is going to get the reference, uh, but uh, as, as somebody who grew up through the 90s and the whole speculator boom and everything that came out of that, uh-huh. uh, I was roaring with laughter when I saw this. You did a Levi's commercial, and you even put in the video tracking on the, uh, the, to make it yeah. look like this was recorded in like 1993. Well, I'm not technically wearing Levi's. <laughs> <laughs> it's technically it's a G-Man commercial. Right. But I can see why you might have made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so to bring people up to speed who haven't seen this, uh, in the 90s, Rob Liefeld was on a uh, commercial. Uh, it was a Spike, Spike Lee commercial, was it not? Yeah, Spike Lee directed a series of commercials for Levi's. Yeah, and, and, and there was a Rob Liefeld one. And Matt, can we just pipe in the, the video over top? We don't have to actually hear the audio uh, while we talk about it. But... Uh, and it was it was Spike Lee looking at Rob Liefeld drawing and like he draws like a character design uh, of Spike Lee with a camera on his head and then, but uh, you you sh- you shot like almost a shot for shot parody yeah. of that yeah. commercial promoting G Man. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, Dave's watching it now. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's man, it's uncanny. And look look at this. You've got the cameraman, uh, the camera guy, uh, camera on his head so character. Wrong. Chris. Uh, and Chris. the chroma key stuff with you G-Man in the background. But the best no. moment just, uh, of this video uh, is when they say guess. like uh, something about, like, well, how do your parents fit. feel about you making a living at this? You like, <laughs> Learning to fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because in the, the original video, you know, Liefeld says that his parents hated it, but now that they see he can make a living at it, you know, there's no complaint. <laughs> <laughs> and it could have been more opposite for me. <laughs> oh, man, that was great. So, yeah, uh, 
you do have to have. I mean, it is a compulsion because, yeah, it's exceedingly difficult to make any kind of respectable living at this thing. Or at the very least, if you are making a respectable living, there's always the threat that it could be taken away from you at any moment, right? Yeah. Um, but I want to go back to the sense of being honest with kids because another thing that uh, you've talked about in other interviews, and by the way, we will link in the show notes. People are going to be asking, like, why didn't you go into the whole why did, how did you get into comics, Chris, discussion. Um, that's covered on the Stuff Said Show. Stuff Said Show episodes one and two are a lengthy discussion on your history in comics. So I want to get at some of the more theoretical stuff behind this. And, like, one of the things you talked about is it's G-man, not G-boy. Why is that? Why was that an important decision to make in making a comic for kids? Um, well, the... the the non-sophisticated answer is it's just that's what was my nickname when I was, like that's what my friends called me growing up. Oh, but, but but to get more into it, I think like when I was a kid and played superhero, you know, I wanted to be Batman or Superman or Green Lantern. I didn't want to be Robin. Right. I didn't want to be Superboy. You didn't want to so, be Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, which you know, I mean, if I think about it now, I could, I like, I could see why adults would make that mistake. Like, oh, you know, like, if this, if there's not Wendy and Marvin in this cartoon, then how, what are the kids gonna? How are the kids gonna follow? Yeah, who are they, <laughs> gonna, are they gonna relate to? to? <laughs> It's so funny to think about that now, you know. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the vehicle character, the kid character yeah. that we're supposed to Plus, identify. You know, with. that's why Robin showed up in the Batman comics. So, like, mm -hmm. we got to give someone for the kids to identify with. The kids are identifying with Batman, right? Yeah. Well, that worked but, out. I don't though. mean to say I don't mean to say Robin's not cool. Oh, I mean, is. but but there was actually there was there was an awesome episode of the Super Friends where uh, I think all the Super Friends get their powers taken away somehow. And uh, and some kind of like Frankenstein super monster is made from their powers. Right, and Robin right, right. Somehow escaped, gave himself <laughs> the the same powers with the same kind of a treatment, and then he was like Super Robin. Right. And then he went and saved everybody, and I was like, oh wow, that's awesome. He's like Super Robin now, and I liked him. <laughs> <laughs> right back to being regular normal Robin. <laughs> was this was this the uh, 1973 series or one of the later series? This episode, do you remember? I thought. I was. Cause I need to watch this one. I don't remember it. I, was, I think it was more from like the later '80s. Okay. Yeah, it's, I'm I'm recalling it in the dim recesses of my memory. Yeah. And, but because you know I saw but them all. It probably actually probably was from the '70s, and I was watching it in the '80s. Okay. Well, I'll have to go back through. I'll go to Wikipedia and I'll look all these up. Uh, but uh, but okay. So yeah, G man, like this is. I I thought that was a really insightful statement on your part. Is this idea that Kids don't want to be talked down to. They don't want to say, you know, uh, well, you know, like uh, Superboy kind of thing, even though Superboy is an interesting character. But, like, if you make a new character, uh, I, I guess where I'm going with this is, is that an interesting thing you set up in the story is that the adults are helpful, but not always. Some yeah. of the adults are threats. Some of the adults are less than helpful, right? Some of the adults are kind of dumb. You know, but but not, not all of them. Some of them, some of them are great. Like for instance, Captain uh, Sun Trooper Captain Davis, right, uh, is like the helpful guidance adult uh, who's aware of the real threat that the kids are aware of. But you never go so far as to say like, well, all the adults are stupid and they don't realize what's really at stake, and only the kids are in on it. You present right. a very measured way of looking at it, but the kids are the ones who are making, flipping all the switches to fix the problems, right? Yeah. So, yeah, um, I think um, oh, I can't remember what I was gonna say. I had a thought in my head, and now it's gone. I talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too I'm too simple minded. You know? No, no, I I wind up putting four questions into one <laughs> sentence, and then you, you get an idea when I'm midstream, and then I don't stop and let you talk. So so so, Jersey, I think what you're kind of saying here is that it's important for the kids in the story to have agency. Yeah, that's right? a great way of putting it. Kids having agency, but not. But, but what I love yeah, about there's there's a lot of cases where the you know G man and his friends they're going toe to toe with adult threats. Mm -hmm. They're not they're not just fighting like other kids with you know it's it's like the bad guys are adults trying to destroy them, and that's like in real life that's maybe the most scary real thing that a kid has to deal with is that yeah not every adult is going to be your friend and they're probably the most dangerous people in your life if they're not good if they're not good at heart 
so I'm without spoiling too much. Yeah, here's a moment in the story where G-Man and Great Man walk outside, and there's like a hundred Sun Troopers waiting for him. Adult, fully fledged, you know, Sun Troopers coming uh -huh. at him, saying, "You're not going anywhere. You're coming with us." And you did enough setup before that moment to really uh, drive home this fact that, oh, they don't want to just arrest you. They have something more sinister in mind. Is, yeah. yeah, and it's even worse because they're supposed to be the good guys. Yeah. So, yeah, that that sort of thing. And uh, I think that's the sort of thing that a kid is going to appreciate a little, little bit more than just, you know, everything's sunshine and rainbows all the time. Right, and, like, and the adult's going to get a pie in the face and his pants are going to fall down and you're all going to point and laugh at him because adults are dumb after all, right? Like that, that kind yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, you can't make all the, all the adults dumb either because right. kids know that all adults aren't dumb or all adults aren't evil or all adults aren't getting in their way. Some adults are that way. In fact, sometimes when you're a kid, it seems like many of these adults are that way. <laughs> <laughs> they don't understand you. They don't understand what's, what's going on. Um, they think they know more than you do, all that sort of thing. But they know there's like, like that one cool uncle or somebody like that who that's true. who always has time for them, who doesn't talk down to them. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's always that for for most kids, hopefully, there's a trusted adult in there. You know, um, and if you're if you're lucky, you got lots of those adults in your life. Yeah. Um, but it's a you know, but every even if you're the lucky kid, there's always that one adult who's like always uh, he doesn't get it, he doesn't get any way, or he's seems to be operating against your interests, right? <laughs> well, actually, there's a great moment in Cape Crisis where a kid, one of the kids who steals the or has one of the armbands that gives him super flight goes home, and the dad's like, what's that sissy thing you got in your arm? What is that, a gold bracelet? You know, take that off. And then the kid's like, no, but dad, it's going to be superpowers. And the dad's like, ah, what, we used to like baseball. What's happened to you? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the, the superheroes show up, take the armband away from the kid. And as the kid goes back inside, the dad's like, now, if you had powers and superpowers, then you'd be something. Then it'd be something I could respect or something. that the kid's like, ah. Uh, which is a funny joke, but it's also that moment that all kids can relate to. But can we then agree that Greg Shegel of Stuff Said Show is right? You do have to have kind of a mature worldview, uh, or at least a, a mature worldview helps in writing stories for kids because you are acknowledging the entire picture, the entire like uh, point of view that a kid is going through. Yeah, I don't have any problem uh, agreeing that Greg Shegel is right about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we talked about kid logic. We talked about making stories appealing to kids. Um, just real quick, very briefly, because we're going to get into book recommendations pretty soon here. Uh, you know, one of the things that happened last night when I was tweeting about how moved I was by G-Man was, um, you know, other people were chiming in saying, like, yeah, there's just something so darn charming and appealing about it. And I was just having a discussion with my students the other day about how, you know, they were asking, like, oh, i got to learn how to draw this right. i got to learn how to draw this right. They're 12. Right. And then I got to learn how to draw this right. And I'm like, look, that's important. But what's also really important is learning how to draw things that are appealing. And I went into this whole thing about, like, look at all these cartoonists nowadays who don't have technical skill, but have appeal. Tony Cliff said recently, uh, Tony Cliff of DelilahDirk.com said, uh, you know, technical skill is divorced from appeal nowadays. Like, technical skill can lead to appeal, but you don't need it anymore. And you think of things like The Oatmeal, think of things like XKCD, Cyanide and Happiness, all these popular comics where they, there's, you know, less than technical skill going on there, or less technical skill than somebody like, say, Chris Giuroso. So my question is, Chris, how would you define appeal in, in comics, I know it's a big squishy <laughs> question. I'm throwing a big, stupid philosophical question, but you know it when you see it. Like, what cartoonists capture appeal in their work, like a, a cartoon appeal, and uh, you know, what what steps do you take to try to achieve it in your work? You've talked about well, this before, like black spotting and things. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you talked about like 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 spotting your blacks in your stories, which you know when you look at the work, you can see it in there that you know how to spot blacks. Like, well, that, yeah, that, I mean, that's something I I I wasn't very good at in the very beginning. Yeah. I'm I'm flattered that you think I'm better at it now. <laughs> um, but what I was about to what I was thinking is that I tend to gravitate towards cartoonists that are complete cartoonists, the guys that will write and draw everything on their own. So. I appreciate a, like a wide variety of different artistic styles. I seem to appreciate the pure voice. So if you look at somebody like uh, like Jeff Smith, he writes it and draws it. Stan Sakai, 
Um, mm -hmm. Jack Kirby to a big extent. You know, I know a lot of people think that the words weren't his, but I certainly think the ideas and most of the words were. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob Shabbat. Yeah. His mighty Skull Boy Army. Yeah. Uh, Dave Roman's Astronaut Academy. Yeah. Reina. Um, Akira Toriyama with uh, Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. I, I, don't, I know that it, like, that's almost kind of like selling out to say that you like that stuff, but eh. I think he's fantastic. He is fantastic. And, like, uh, and that's, that's the sort of book that like, when I see, you know, a lot of people think, oh, manga is horrible, <laughs> which I don't understand because it's just comic books. Right. <laughs> like, oh, the big guys. Everyone thinks that, that all, all that stuff looks the same, but I can pick out Akira Toriyama among any other Japanese manga stuff. Yeah. You know, in a second, just because I've, you know, really fallen in love with his work. Um, so I think for me, that's where appeal comes from. Is somebody's got like their ideas and they're able to execute them really well. Um, uh, Charles Schultz is another example. Like he, I grew up on Charles Schultz, Bill Watterson. You know, it was very common for newspaper comic strip artists to be, you know, they, they do all the work. A lot of those Mad Magazine guys, Sergio Aragones, Jack Al Jaffe. Davis. They wrote it and drew it, yeah. and it's like a it's a pretty big variety of different styles. Uh, Eric Larson is another example of like a guy that's still doing like superheroes the way he wanted to do them. He writes it and he's written and drawn every issue. He's approaching two hundred issues wow. of Savage Dragon. I know that that's not maybe the most popular uh, opinion. But <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, mad props to anyone who can do two hundred issues of anything writing and drawing and, and well, doing all that so and the other crazy thing about eric larson is there's no mistaking his work right i mean it's, it's his voice in there oh, yeah. you, you, you know it know it's his and you know he's doing what he wants to do yeah and and i you can admire somebody who can do that and make a career out of out of being able to do that oh yeah um and, simonson is another guy who's like that simonson you know it when you see i was it. about to say the same thing yeah. who's i think you know one of larson's influences yeah. as well as kirby uh, John Byrne, back mm -hmm. in the day at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mike Mignola, Frank Miller. So, okay, you are brilliant because you led me into a perfect segue into where I wanted to close on this is style talk. Uh, because you're talking about, like, finding – we've talked on the show a lot about finding your voice. And this is kind of like this idea of creating appeal is finding your signature look and feel, which comes out of finding your voice. But part of finding your voice is finding your style. Um, speaking of Greg Shegel again, one of the things he and I have talked about on the show is on, on this show and on his is this idea that um, when you don't have a signature style, it makes it really hard to it makes it complicated to try to sell yourself as an artist, right? Because you, you, you can say I could do anything, right? I could. Yeah, do so it's like almost like Greg is too talented for his own good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's like I, I think I called him. Uh, he's like the Paul Giamatti of comics. He's a character actor. He, <laughs> he could do anything you want, but he, but you know, it's like you can't pin down what is that essential Paul Giamatti ness to him. It's not like Christopher Walken, where it's like, oh, <laughs> you, you know what Christopher Walken's gonna do in a, in a movie, right? But um, but you've got, you know, there's there's a Chris Jerusso style. So my question is, and this is a less squishy one. Uh, do you ever feel constricted by having a signature style, or is it pretty awesome because like people know what to expect from you? Uh, in, in other words, is is the grass really greener where you are, and Greg is looking in, going like, "Oh man, that's so great," and you're like, "Yeah, it is." Or are there drawbacks to having a signature style? Well, the the good thing about having the signature style is that I like I'm it's I'm I'm fortunate that some people like it because that's the only way I know how to draw. <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's kind of the opposite problem of Greg, whereas Greg, you know, he can do anything. I can't. Like, this is the only thing that I'm able to do. And, like, I'm not very, um, you know, I, I don't have I don't have the technical skill to, like, sit down and, like, learn, like, different, you know, structures. I'm not really uh, trained. It's just kind of, like, make it, made it up as I went along. When I first started getting, when I first t started to get serious about it, I knew that I couldn't do the, the quote, unquote, you know, realistic superhero style of the time. Um, so I kind of like, I kind of started back from zero and I, and I thought like, well, how did my brother and I used to draw when we were little, when we were trying to make up, you know, comic strips. Um, and it just evolved from there the way your handwriting evolves. Hmm. So yeah, that's another thing that I had on my list here is that, yeah, you, you're mostly self-taught, right? 
Pretty much. You know, Greg, Greg throws me some lessons here and there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's, there's also proof that just getting in and doing it over and over again adds up to a lot to developing appeal, developing your voice, developing your own idiosyncratic style will hopefully lead to creating a sense of. I think, I think uh, this, this reminds me of Ira Glass talking about your, um, your ability catching up to your taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard this where he talks about like what you, you get into something cause you're inspired by something because you have good taste and then you go out and you try to make your first thing and you know, it's, you, it's, it's okay, but it's not as good as you want it to be. You know that it's not good. You know that it's falling short of where you want it to be because your talent hasn't evolved to that spot yet. So much along those lines, yeah, it, it takes a long time to develop and get better and get better as you go. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that I didn't get to put on my uh, – we didn't get to discuss today is that you letter by hand. And one of the things – I think the first – my first gut reaction to the book was, like, I love the text density in this. And I remember Chris looking at me like, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Uh, but it, it was, again, it spoke to – that. one of the things that I love about your work is it's, it's pure comics. And it's not pure comics in the experimental formalist way of I'm going to challenge you by doing things that only comics can do, but by really playing to the strengths of the medium and saying, you know what, I'm going to have a panel and there's going to be 12 word balloons in it and it's not going to feel weird because that's how pacing works in comics. You get to do that and we don't have to try to be something that we're not. I don't know if that was something that you were shooting for or if it just, again, just comes out of your natural sense of worldview and taste, but it, it communicates. It communicated to me and it hit me right in the middle of the forehead. It's like, oh, yeah. This is what it was like reading comics when I was a kid. And that's why I had so much fun reading this, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it's funny because when, you know, when I finished Cape Crisis and even when I was working on, on Coming Home, I, you know, I'd look at other comics and I'd always be struck by the idea, like, oh, I, I, might, I, need to, I need to lighten up on the text. So that's why I was so shocked when you told me that you liked how much uh, I was putting in on each page. But... I think I think the reason that happened is because I was accustomed to doing short comic strips uh. or, you know, like three panels or just one full page. So you kind of have to cram everything in there that you can. And so that was my habit that didn't I didn't really break as I started expanding into longer stories. I, I, I tended to keep on cramming a lot onto each page. And that that's one of the things I feel like I, I do need to lighten up. a little. I need to like like let it breathe a little bit more. And I, I tried to in coming home, and then there's but there's certain pages I go to, and I go, wow, this is, this could have been two pages, or you know, I but that, know. that's that's one of those things. You're always evolving. You're always trying to like, you're always trying to improve, and it's you know, it's not always an easy choice to, or it's not always like clear like what's what's better if one is better than the other. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, there's like plenty of moments in the story where you take time to let moments breathe in the story right where you're not like hitting us over the head with like a whole lot of narrative text where you let like the images do the talking and stuff i felt like it was very well paced out it just felt like like you know when you watch his girl friday and like you're not confused by the dialogue you're not like what did they say again like they worked really hard to layer the dialogue in such a way that you can get it all and it just feels like whoa that was like a four-hour movie in two hours you know but it didn't feel off I feel like that's like when comics are like that's that's a strength of comics that I get really excited about when I see it done. And, you know, we, we're kind of coming out of like a decade of people trying to make comics that feel like movies. Right. And so to read something like this is just like utterly refreshing again. So whatever reasons behind it, uh, it I think it comes out great. I mean, like, you know, again, going back to that double or that bit, full page spread of all the Sun Troopers showing up. You know, one little dialogue exchange. You're not filling it up with a bunch of unnecessary stuff there, right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I guess I've, I've maybe succeeded to an extent, <laughs> <laughs> letting it breathe a little bit more. So. And here's another thing to look forward to, folks. If you haven't watched, if you haven't read this book yet, is a wizard serving pizza to superheroes with a. Uh, I don't know if we can get this in the shot, Matt. With with a uh, ram-headed god. Yeah, there it is in the shot. So moments like that punctuated by real moments of danger and terror. And yeah, so it's just, it's, I guess the moral of the story is, is like, try to make your comics fun for crying out loud. Is it, <laughs> would it kill you to make me laugh? You know, that's what I say when I'm at so many movies these days. <laughs> so um, I'll, we're going to get to book recommendations because we're running out of time. But 
I'll let you have the last word, Chris, since you are the new guest to the show. Uh, anything that we didn't touch on about G-Man that you wish we would have? Um, nothing I can think of offhand. I could let you know tomorrow, like, <laughs> oh, I wish we talked about this. <laughs> but I'm not going to think of it right now. Well, we can always have you back. Another, another idea that I'm playing with is doing some audio-only episodes in between the video shows to allow for more room for this kind of discussion, and so we're not under such a time crunch. Um, so if you ever feel like being a little bit more philosophical, I'd love to have you on for that, too. Sure. But, uh, okay, so let's talk about appearances, upcoming events, and book recommendations. So, uh, and Sharon Iverson is in the building. She'll be in here shortly after Yay. Dave does his book recommendations. But and Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. So, um, but first, we got to talk about our thing that's coming up. Yep. Um, as everybody who listens to the show knows, I'm sure by now, that Kids Read Comics is coming up in June. Yeah. Um, June 22nd and 23rd here at Ann Arbor District Library downtown. Mm -hmm. um, the day before that, uh, a bunch of us have gotten together and put together a program, a um, professional development program for librarians and teachers and cartoonists. Um, and it's going to be a day full of, of learning and fun <laughs> and comics. Um, <laughs> the, the title we came up with for, for the whole day is Comics, Collections, and the Common Core. Yeah. And um, it's, we're going to kick off in the morning with a session by Jersey. Um, you're doing Comics, A Pathway to Learning. It's um, a two-hour workshop yep. that I did at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts right. uh, where I teach educators and librarians how to create comics programming even if they don't know how to draw. Right. And also, if you're a cartoonist, it's an opportunity to learn how I teach. So if I get emails all the time from cartoonists saying, you know, how do I lead a comics workshop like you do? How do I teach? How do I build a curriculum? This two-hour course teaches you that, and you get a 61-page packet with a whole bunch of pre-made lesson plans so you can get started today. So, yeah. So, so that in and of itself is worth the price of admission. <laughs> which is free. Which is free. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth more than the price of admission on that. Yeah. Um, and then after people go off to lunch, uh, we'll come back in the afternoon. We're going to have a couple of panel discussions uh, that Sharon Iverson has put together for us. Um, the first is a panel of uh, librarians who select comics, uh, talking about what they look for in comics for their collections and, and how they decide what they're going to buy and how they find out about comics and, and look for comics. Um, so that should be um, informative uh, for folks. And then immediately after that, we're going to have a panel of uh, cartoonists. It's going to be Raina and Dave and you, I think. Yep, I'm moderating a panel with Dave Roman and Raina Telgemeier, uh, other artists to be announced. Right. But, but Raina Telgemeier, enough <laughs> said. <Yeah. laughs> um, and you're going to talk about um, how, I, I want to say how to read comics, but it's a little more, it's a little more, one of the Isn't things that? that I get from educators and librarians is when I show them like a Walt Simonson page and he's doing something kooky with the layout that, that defies traditional reading directions, they're like, whoa, you know, how do I read this? Yeah. And so comics is a language and comics has its own idiosyncrasies and idiomatic expressions like Octu Liber means roughly, oh, uh, my love, but that's not exactly what it means. It means like, oh, for heaven's sake, right? There's idiomatic things in comics that... Uh, you know, you have to learn how to read. And so this uh, panel will be for people who have ever looked at a comic going, this is a little bit complicated. Uh, we'll, we're going to crack the code for you. All right. <laughs> and then after that, there's more. Uh, we're going to split off into two different sessions. Um, one's going to be down at the U of M Museum of Art. Yep. Um, and it's going to be an uh, interactive talk on Art Tells Stories. Mm -hmm. And basically it's going to, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong here, huh? um, it's going to be uh, looking at um, comics as it relates to fine arts in general yep. and looking at examples from fine arts of, of things that we don't think about as comics but do have sequential st storytelling, like panel art and, and things Sequential like that. storytelling also, if you think about the cor four common tools of cartooning, shape, size, line, and color, there you right? Go. And uh, fine art does this. And Dr. Dave Chaburka of the uh, University of Michigan Museum of Art is going to be doing a talk, an interactive talk where you can participate, where he shows how fine artists have been doing this all along. And so it's going to help with your sense of visual literacy. And, and contextualizing comics within the world of, of art. Exactly. Um, and then at the same time, uh, we're going to have a session up in the uh, Special Collections Library. Uh, mm -hmm. Julie Heretta, who's in charge of the Labity Collection, is going to have a selection of comics from their collection, a lot of underground comics and things like that, stuff you may have heard of or seen reproductions of but not actually seen awesome. the, the real things. Um, so that should be incredibly cool. And then in the evening, <laughs> um, we're going to have a comics hangout at Dominic's, which is a local watering hole. Mm -hmm. And we're going to set out a big sheet of paper and do some jam drawing and, um, and 
socializing and uh, drink and draw. Drink and draw. There you go. A drink and draw at Dominic's to conclude the festivities on Friday evening right. before we kick into KRC. Um, so you can find out more details about all these sessions um, on the Kids Read Comics site, mm -hmm. um, kidsreadcomics.org. That's right. Or ca Kid com. I think both go there, but right. kidsreadcomics.org is what we like to use because we are a nonprofit. Right. And look for the comics collections in the Common Core. There'll in the be sidebar. A, there'll be a link there to the um, registration form. We are asking people to register. There's a limited number of seats for Jersey session in the morning and for the two late afternoon sessions um, yep. at the Museum of Art. Um, so we ask you to register so uh, we know that you're there. Your session in the morning is already more than half full. Oh, wow. So, cool. Um, but if... if um, if there's no seats left, we'll wait list people mm -hmm. um, for that. So, so feel free to still sign up, um, and hopefully we'll let you know if you can do that. It also helps us know, you know, how much food to get for folks and things That's like right. that. That's right. There will be some, some minor refreshments there. Right. So, yeah, it's going to be a fun time. Comics and, Collections and Comic Core. And the, and the cost is free. totally free. So it would be an opportunity for cartoonists to meet some educators and librarians. It would be an opportunity for educators and librarians to meet some cartoonists and find out what we can learn from one another uh, the Friday before we kick into Kids Read Comics proper. Okay, cool. Um, right. So book recommendations. Book recommendations. What do you got? So I looked around the condo this morning for, for kids superhero comics uh -huh. and pulled a few off the shelf and then checked when I got here and say, oh good, ADL has some of these things <laughs> available for folks. Um, so I'm going to uh, start off with the uh, Justice League Unlimited. I can show you. There's a little collection of that. When the cartoon, Justice League Unlimited cartoon was going on, um, DC was putting out um, a, a comic, you know, basically tying into that. Adam Beechin wrote most of the, most of the comics of mm -hmm. that. And it's all your favorite, you know, Flash and I'm, I'm looking at Ash and show it to folks. <laughs> <laughs> Mirror uh, Master. Flash, Mirror Master, Superman, Wonder Woman, all the folks. Um, and not, th these were, at the time when they were coming out, these are my favorite Justice League comics. Oh, without it, a doubt. You know, it's a, you know, done in one stories, but not simple. Uh, it, was, it, it sort of felt a lot like a throwback to the comics that we were reading yeah. um, as kids. Um, and so I was, I was devouring these, you know, who cared what was going on? <laughs> you know, who, like, who was sleeping with whom, and you know what? Who who lost their powers this you know this month? And right, um, and what continuity's been reset? Ex exactly, exactly. Right, I, yeah. I just I just want you know Superman and and Flash to be teaming up and saving the world and, and stuff like that. So. Yeah, um, no, we, we've talked about this before on Greg's show, too, is that Justice League Unlimited, what is better than that show that, and that comic? That, that may have been one of my favorite superhero TV shows of all time. And uh, I was watching unreal. it, you know, late 30s when oh, I, yeah, was, me too. I was on. I'm like, this is, kids don't know how lucky they are <laughs> <laughs> to have this. I mean, we liked Super Friends when we were kids, but that didn't, you know, hold a candle to, to what was going on. What was more when amazing? We, that, when we were kids, yeah. uh, the, the Super Friends cartoon, you know, got you into comics, and then you started reading the comics, and they were better than the cartoon. Right. By the time the Justice League Unlimited cartoon was on, like, that was better than anything you could read in a comic. Yeah, yeah. That's that's unfortunate, but but, but yeah, luckily is... they were doing tie-in comics, which yeah. which I think maintained the quality, um, and and this the the ethos of what was going on. Absolutely, yeah. that, Bruce, that Bruce Tim style is fantastic. Yeah. That yeah. is like razor sharp, perfect. Yeah, any of the talk about cartoon appeal, right? Yeah, any yeah. of the um, tie-in comics from the Bruce Tim, the Batman Adventures, the Superman Adventures comics, um, great Batman and Superman comics can be enjoyed by anyone, including kids. Hey, didn't Greg Shegel do one of the Batman Adventures books? I think I don't think he did a a, 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 a comic book, but he oh. he's, he did like story books with in that animated style. Okay, uh, okay. Well, we'll have to you, find out which one. You have to ask him to double check. Greg, hey Greg. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get it. I want to link to it in the show notes uh, where people can get that and then support Greg some more. Sell, sell more of the books with his art in it so he can draw some more superheroes for us. Um, so what else? I want, to, can... I want to see Greg's own superheroes more than I want to see him doing Actually, Batman. Actually, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I want to see a Pix book. I want to see a series on that. I want, to, I want to see something utterly brand new that Greg creates from scratch. I want to see his own characters. You're right. So Greg, make the time for it. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> then I brought um, Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane, which was uh, Sean McKeever and, and uh, Takeshi Miyazawa. For, mm -hmm. for most of the run, there were some other, I think Terry Moore wrote a few issues, and they had some other artists come in occasionally. But mostly th those two gentlemen were doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was basically the Spider-Man story when Spider-Man was Peter Parker in high school, told through the eyes of Mary Jane. Oh, cool. Um, and if you, haven't, if you haven't read these, again, it was, it was one of my favorite Spider-Man comics. You know what? I... Who, 
who knows what what clones or <laughs> or alien <laughs> costumes or whatever were going on in the regular Spider-Man comic. This was this was what I wanted to read. It's it's you know Spider-Man being a teenager and having teenage problems and yeah. um, but you know with with a different um, uh, different viewpoint, yeah. a different viewpoint character on there. And Takeshi Miyazawa's art, I could I could look at him draw anything all day. Um, and so both uh, ADL I know has these um, digest collections, both the uh, Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane and Justice League Unlimited. Um, cool. so I don't think you can buy them at stores anymore because they don't keep stuff like this in print. But that's what libraries are good for, is um, keeping stuff available okay. uh, that's out there. So I think I'll stop there because I know that Chris is going to have some stuff and Sharon's going to have some stuff, and I've talked way too much. So <laughs> I will get out of the chair and Sharon will slide in while that's okay, happening. But can where can people find you? Dave Reads Comics on um, Twitter. At Dave Reads Comics on the Twitters is probably the best place to, to okay. find me out there. So yeah, thanks for having me on, Jersey. No, thanks for being here. Thanks for helping, or thanks for spearheading and leading the team for the Comics Collections and the Common Core event, uh, June June twenty first, twenty thirteen. Yep, and so go to kidsreadcomics.org and search for Comics Collections and the Common Core, and mm. get all the information you want and come. Yeah, you, and you don't need to show up for the whole day. You, yep. if, you, if you only have time for the panel discussions, or you only got time in the morning or in the late afternoon, or you only want to show up to Dominic's um, mm. in the evening, uh, we encourage you to come for uh, whatever part appeals to you. Uh, yeah, so that would be awesome. And then, and then also, there's been talk about giving a tour of the video game library on Sunday uh, during Kids Read Comics. We'll field the, the field Twitter for interest. If if you're interested in a tour of the video game library, and you want to see the Virtual Boy at tweet. Uh, Dave Carter. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, I got to get out of here where Jersey makes me do more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dave. All right, so um, Chris, did you have any book recommendations you wanted to throw out while we wait um, for Sharon to get here? Well, let's oh. see. <laughs> There's the, the G Man series. Well, okay, I guess it's too self serving to like ram that down your throat anymore. Uh, well, that was my book recommendation too. So, um, but uh, I can't recommend Jacob Shabbat's *The Mighty Skullboy Army* enough. Yeah, this is a uh, you know Jacob's a modern master. Uh, if you like humor, comics, um, I've actually had G-Man uh, has had a small crossover with Skullboy at one point or another, and, and um, that's about all I'll say. Oh wait, Faith Aaron Hicks has a. Uh, what is uh, Nothing Adventures of, of uh, Superhero Girl? Oh, I yeah, think. yeah. Adventure. Which I haven't read yet, but I've, you know, I'm, her work is fantastic. I've read her um, Friends with Boys. I met her last year at uh, one of the, uh, the library shows and was just immediately talent struck with how, how good she is. Yeah, so. she's pretty good. She's got, uh, yeah, uh, Superhero Girl. Do you remember the name of that, Sharon? Probably not. Uh, not Adventures of Superhero Girl. Um, if Eric's still in the chat, maybe he can find it. But she also has another book uh, that just came out, um, Nothing Can Possibly Go Wrong, which we talked about in the show. It's like uh, about robot fighting, but not the giant robot kind, more like the kids, the science kids making, uh, you know, little Roomba robots with saws on them to, to do battle. Um, but yeah, you can, you can find that uh, online at nothingcanpossiblygowrong.com. But Jacob Shabbat, I mean, that guy is, he's off the hook. I don't know what the heck is in his brain, but everything he does is so crisp and clean and so, again, cartoon appeal. It's so fun to look at his characters doing things, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, any others before we get, hand it over to Sharon? Let's hand it over to Sharon. Okay, Sharon <laughs> Iverson of the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aadl.org. Good to Hello. see you. Hello. Hey, hi. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I brought a few superhero comics of my own. Okay. Uh, as only Sharon Iverson can do. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> I have, <laughs> I have. This is a couple of years old by Kazuki Ebine, uh, a manga biography of Gandhi, oh. who many people I'm sure probably consider. Yep. Um, consider him kind of an amazing, superhuman hero. Yes. Um. To me, I mean, the story, of course, a lot of people know, but I was just so impressed with the, the way it was laid out. It's all in um, black and white and grays. and um, it's, a, it's a manga. It's a manga, but it's, it's, not, it's not, I mean, it's manga, but it's not, it doesn't smack me as manga. Mm -hmm. it, it, where there are need to be quiet moments, it's just incredible. The face of Gandhi is just, wow. Um, so well done as he goes through life. I mean, here he is quite a bit younger, but um, I just, I don't know. It was just, 
pretty cool. I don't know how I bumped into that. I've not, I've not heard of that, so okay. that's cool. Well, and have you met Nathan Hale? I have not met Nathan Hale, but I'm familiar with his work because his work was nominated for a Kids Comics Revolution Award, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, well, Nathan Hale did Nathan Hale. Ah. Um, the biography of Nathan Hale and his uh, hazardous tales, One Dead Spy. And who, who but him, I guess, could create a storyline out of Nathan on the gallows about to be hung, and it's basically a spin of of what happened in his life between he, the hangman, and a British soldier. But um, through the storyline, there's a, <laughs> there's a character that I guess I kind of knew about, but I just had to, every time he entered, I was like, what? Um, there's this guy named Henry Knox. Mm -hmm. Henry Knox is a kid, blew through three fingers off of his hand um, playing around with guns and grew up to become kind of the master um, artillery man for the Revolutionary Army. And so through the comic, when he, you know, when they capture Fort Ticonderoga, he said, oh, I'll take 60 of those, and um, I'm going to drag these suckers on the ship, and we're going to sail across the water, and then we're going to drag them on sled through the snow. And um, when one, when they, when they um, have trouble crossing where the ice is too tight, um, they create kind of this uh, makeshift bridge. They get them all across except his favorite gun he <laughs> names his gun lucy and uh it goes down and he's like nope we're not leaving without lucy uh. so so the, you know <laughs> to me american history really comes to life um yeah, through books say, like yeah. that you know it's pretty tolerable um this i was kind of intrigued this is pandemonium by chris wooding who's a fantasy uh fiction writer mm. and he teamed up with Cassandra Diaz who is to me new I think she's fairly new to the world of comics and puts together what will become I'm sure a series about um, a character who is a local skull ba ball um, hero a kind of a la Harry Potter mm. flying through the trees you can see he has wings on the front um, this guy's name is Cypher Tombchewer, and he lives kind of in a remote community. He wants uh, to kind of go over the mountain and see what's beyond, and gets to do it in a way he didn't expect when he's knocked out and drugged to the royal palace, and discovers that the king, or the prince, uh, Pandemonium, has disappeared. Mm -hmm. And conveniently, Cypher has an amazing resemblance to the prince <laughs> and has to step in the role. And so, you know, it's it's one of these adventures that you kind of go, well... I see uh, a giant cat. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a fearsome giant cat. I forgot you like stuff like that. <laughs> and and it has, I mean, it, it has <laughs> elements in the story that really are fun. It's funny. It's manga to me. Yeah. And, um, it's definitely like shoujo manga looking. But it, but it's just kind of a, it was different, and I thought, ah, because hmm. I liked him as a writer of fantasy, and then I just, I haven't read this yet, but um, I heard about Will and Wit by Laura Lee Gulledge, and I decided, well, I'll start back one and uh, get page by page, and this is a story about a girl who has, her family has been moved into the big city, and she's kind of struggling to figure out who she is. Um, what she wants to be, really, she wants to be an artist, um, <laughs> and how that goes forward. And so I have yet to read that, but it looks it looks like it's going to be pretty cool. And do you know, Laura? I Lee don't. Lee? I okay. don't. Okay. Well, no, you you've know, introduced me to like three new books today. Well, I have always more to read. I have to, <laughs> I have to get Chris's books now. You know, you thanks do. for having new guests on. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got to get these books in the library. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, that would be my book recommendation is get G-Man Coming Home. If you're watching live today, go get it and post your proof of purchase to Greg Shegel, uh at Stuff Said Show on the Twitters. Is that right, Greg? I think that's right. Uh, it's at stuffsaidshow.com, and then you can be entered to win awesome stuff. But even if you're listening to this after the fact, you will not regret this book. It is so much fun. As a matter of fact, you can borrow it, Sharon. I just finished it. Oh, I've and been looking at G-Man there next to Chris. It's like, oh, he's so cute. He's, he's, yeah, he's super cute. But he's also, like, he's nothing that would threaten my masculinity as an 11-year-old boy. I'd be like, <laughs> I want to be cool like him, you know. Uh. But then as an adult, I'm looking at him like, he's adorable. <laughs> 
Uh, and then also, I uh, want to one more time recommend Astronaut Academy by Dave Roman. I just got my copy, and uh, you can read the whole webcomic online for I don't know how much longer. Uh, so you're going to have to buy it if you want to read it, but you won't be sorry if you get this book either. Uh, it is so much more drama than in the first book, but uh, ends uh, in a very satisfying way. Um, but again, it's all the stuff we talked about today about, you know, writing for kids and writing something with a real threat of danger and with like real relationships and choices being made and also a really appealing cartooning style. So uh, this will be in the collection soon, I'm sure. Yeah. It okay. just came out. So Sharon, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Chris, is there any appearances that we should make some noise about? Um, Where are you going to be? Probably, but I, I can't remember what's the next <laughs> big one at the moment. <laughs> We should say that you're on the latest episode of Stuff Said, which just dropped today. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Episode There's 29 that. with uh, you, Jacob Shabbat, who we were talking about, and uh, Brian Smith. And that's at StuffSaidShow.com. If you really want the whole address, everybody, slash question mark P equals 782. But it's episode 29. Uh, you can find it in your favorite podcast feed. Uh, and it's, again, it's, you also find information there about the G-Man contest. Comics collections in the Comic Common Core at kidsreadcomics.org. Also, Kids Re Comics Revolution Awards. Uh, we're having a, an award show at Kids Read Comics this year, uh, Sunday, the 23rd. Uh, we're going to conclude the entire festival with an award show where uh, kids vote on their favorite kids' comics. We've got a ballot at kidsreadcomics.org. You can also go to comicsagreat.com and find it in the in the news blog there. Um, but you can vote online. You can also download a PDF that you can uh, give to kids to fill out and then mail back in. June 10th is the deadline if you want to mail it in, though. Got to have it to me by June 10th. Otherwise, it won't get counted. So, okay, with that all out of the way, thank you, Chris. This was a fun discussion. Thank you. Thank it was. Thanks for having me on. I can't wait to come back. I, okay, good, because I want you to come back because we got a okay. lot more to talk about. we got to talk about all a whole bunch more superhero stuff. Um, and Sharon, thank you for your time today and for your great book recommendations. Uh, thanks everybody for downloading, listening, and watching. This show will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG78. You can find Chris G. Russo's work at chrisgcomics.com and chris underscore Geruso on the Twitters. And uh, Sharon, you're just at comics.adl.org, yeah? Yeah. Okay, we'll get you on Twitter someday. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> until next time, everybody. Thank you to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster and all the guys in the control room and the Ann Arbor District Library for helping me put on this show every two weeks. Uh, until next time, two weeks from now, uh, I have been Jersey Droz of comicsgreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.